Now we come to some translations which are very interesting, and we return to the book of Ezekiel, which I already read to you last time, but here we see a new element, a new element in chapter 10. Ezekiel gives us a whole series of descriptions of the movements, of the noises that Yahweh's kavod makes. He tells us how this kavod is in some way mechanically connected to the cherubim, how they get up together, how they move, how they make noise. A noise which, when they are inside the external courtyard of the temple, can be heard by those who are outside the walls of the courtyard, who therefore do not see what happens, but hear what happens. So it is clear that it is not a vision that concerns Ezekiel exclusively, but he says that at a certain point, and here we are in chapter 10, verse 13. When talking about wheels that are precisely connected to these, he says, I felt that the wheels were called turbines. Now, in Hebrew there is Hegel Gaul, that is, there is the article. If we had to translate exactly, we should say, these wheels were called the whirlwind. And this is a translation that is very interesting, because it is found in various Bibles. Other Bibles, in the uncertainty of the translation of this term, Galgal, prefer not to translate it. Furthermore, Galgal would actually mean a wheel that swirls. And so, hearing that the wheels were called the wheel is trivial. So, it is clear that the author of this verse wanted to indicate with this Galgal something very particular. For example, the Greek Bible of the 70s does not translate it. Evidently, they did not know how to render it, and therefore in Greek it renders it as gelkel, which is also not found in the dictionaries, in the sense that it does not have a meaning. It is left as it is with a transliteration. This French Bible, verse 10 to 13, translates, the wheels were called tourbillons, and in the note, it says that it therefore indicated whirling wheels, Rue tourbillonante. Therefore, it specifies that they were particular wheels. I would almost be tempted to shift the emphasis. Instead of turbine, say turbine because that would correspond, but this is my thought. So, take it that way. What I mean is, the descriptions we have actually make us think about this, above all the fact that the author of Ezekiel felt the need to indicate it precisely. And that therefore, he didn't mean the wheels are called wheels because it's so banal, that it would be downright ridiculous. This Bible published by the Geneva Bible House, which is the one that publishes Bibles for the whole world, also here says, I heard that the wheels were called whirlwinds. Martin Luther's Bible, however, does something even simpler. It leaves the term as it is, gal-gal. So evidently Luther also had doubts about the translation, and I understand them. So even in this case, I am very pleased to find whirlwinds in the normal translations because I know well that if I translated it like this, or even worse, if I shifted the emphasis, one could say that Biglino is precisely interpreting. Turbine is the definition that we find in various Bibles. Others, as we have seen, prefer not to translate it. And in my opinion, this is the right thing. But what is certain is that they were very particular wheels. Then, Ezekiel in chapter 11 continues to tell us all this set of events that is all this movement that the kavod of Yahweh makes with the cherubim. It lands on them. Then together they rise up, and he says, the cherubim then raised their wings and the wheels moved. They moved together with them, while the kavod of Yahweh of Israel was above them. Then from the center of the city, the kavod of Yahweh rose up and went to stand on the mountain, which is east of the city. 
So Ezekiel is absolutely awake because he tells us a whole series of very precise events. And now let's see how he concludes. And a Ruach here he comes again. And a Ruach lifted me up and took me to Chaldea among the deportees. That is, he had been taken by a Ruach. We have already seen it other times and taken to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he witnesses a series of events and actions carried out by these flying vehicles, after which the Ruach takes him and back to the place where he was in exile together with the other deportees. And at the end of all this, you hear what happens. And the vision that I had seen disappeared before me. Too bad this translation has nothing to do with what is written in Hebrew. I understand that whoever has to explain to us that this is a vision, then in the translations also tries to, let's say, introduce the concept that facilitates this type of interpretation. But now, let's go and see what exactly is written in Hebrew. Here we have what is exactly written in Hebrew, Vayal me alai, which means exactly, and he ascended from above me. So, this is the literal meaning of the Hebrew verse. So, what is written in Hebrew has nothing to do with a vision that disappears. There is a clear concept there. What he saw rises up and goes away from above him. Now, this is a precise description. It is not a vision, and least of all, it is something that disappears. That is, here, really, this little phrase here that we saw in Hebrew could easily be used at the airport when one sees a plane and says, and the plane came up from above me. This is written there, and one may not even like it. I realize it, I understand it perfectly. I understand perfectly those who, let's say, do not want or cannot accept, and therefore have to transform into a vision, what is instead a description. Or, better yet, a set of precise descriptions of precise, concrete events. Mechanical, noisy, seen, seen several times. We even saw in the previous video, Ezekiel saying that, in the second vision, he says, Then I understood there, I understood in the second event, I understood that those were the cherubs that I had seen the first time on the riverbank. So, he even connects these true experiences that he lived. So, this is important. This is important, why? Because it makes us understand how the Bible is extremely concrete, If we then want to transform them into a vision, or do we mean that when the author of the book of Ezekiel, or, as we saw before, Zechariah, or the one who narrated the events of Elijah, tells us one thing, he means another, then I allow myself to say that we must demonstrate it. That is, we must say, I am, I was in the author's head, and I know that when he wrote one thing, he meant another. If we instead stick to what is written, we find everything absolutely coherent. I have already read to you other times what Professor Moraldi says that in the apocryphal texts, in particular in the Hebrew version of the Book of Enoch, there is even talk of 23 different types of divine chariots. In Eastern texts, we still talk about larger numbers of different chariots. Here in the Bible, we have seen at least Ruach, Kevod, Sherubim, Merkava, Epha, Reshev, Megillah. In short, there are a whole series of definitions that tend to identify different means, some of which, due to their characteristics as we have seen, are even defined as a chariot of fire, horses of fire, exactly as they are defined in the Homeric poems. So, in this continuation of pretending that, there is really a lot of concreteness after which, I repeat, this is what is written. In 
From then on, anyone who wants to is obviously free to interpret, but must expressly declare that beyond what is written, from that moment on, the interpretation begins. Because what is written is extremely concrete and precise.